Welcome to the Healing Place podcast, a space filled with inspirational stories of hope, along with practical advice for your healing journey. Your host is Terry Welbrock, trauma warrior, writer, speaker, blogger, therapy dog handler, and founder of the Sammy's Bundles of Hope Project. As a survivor and a thriver, Terry's mission is to shine the light of hope into the world by interviewing insightful guests from across the globe. Please stay tuned at the end of today's interview as we honor our sponsors. The Healing Place podcast is a fiscally sponsored project of Fractured Atlas. Now, here's your host and trauma warrior, Terry Welbrock. Welcome, everybody, to the Healing Place podcast. I am your host, Terry Welbrock, and very excited to have with me today Dr. Sandra Scheinbaum, and she is founder and CEO of the Functional Medicine Coaching Academy. So welcome, Dr. Sandra. Thank you so much, Terry. It is a pleasure to be here. Yes, and just uh, I, I told you before I hit record, I'm really excited about our conversation. It's such a joy to have you here today and excited about the work you're doing in the world. So yeah, tell my audience who you are and what you're doing. Sure. So it's a long story because I'm old, so I won't go into all of the details. Uh, but what I did uh, to start the Functional Medicine Coaching Academy was to take a chance when I was 65. And my career had a lot of twists and turns, a lot of failures, a lot of experiences that didn't turn out that well. Uh, and where I am now isn't where I started. So I thought I was going to be a teacher. And that was my major. And I loved kids, still do, and went into special education and then found that there was something about teaching people to do it themselves that really resonated. So I spent some years at a local college teaching people how to be special ed teachers. And that then one thing led to another, and I was very interested in stress management. Well, we didn't call it that, and we, there was no field like mind-body medicine. We're talking about the early 70s, and started teaching. I was teaching kids, so that I started having groups for parents, helping them deal with the stress in their lives. I was also then teaching teachers and leading workshops for them on stress management and breathing and relaxation was one of the first to introduce biofeedback, uh, which at the time was black boxes with knobs. Now they're apps on your phone. That led to really being interested in clinical psychology. I love learning. So went back at my doctorate and became a clinical psychologist. Now at the time, this was uh, late 70s, early 80s, the world of psychology, and still very much is that way, was very much about what's wrong with you. It was all about let's get to the diagnosis and then have a treatment plan, and it was very demoralizing. I used to think something was wrong with me, like I was looking at somebody's strengths, and that when I was in learning disabilities as well, I was always doing a strength focusing. Well, here, here's a child that is creative, uh, so let's not demoralize him and set him aside to the side to say like, no, we're not going to look at your strengths. We're just going to look at what's wrong, your deficits. And I was always focused on what's right. And that led to studying positive psychology way before it had a name. And that's about what's right and how do people flourish. And that, uh, around that time, led to, I was always interested personally in nutrition and was a so-called health food nut, uh, which I then started to get some training in formally, more in nutrition. And then I started to see stuff coming out about functional medicine. I was a psychologist and my focus in my practice was with people with panic attacks, with anxiety, adults with ADD at the time, but using mind-body medicine, using these kind of alternatives to traditional psychotherapy. And so I then started to put it all together and thought, well, what if created a program to train people to become health coaches? So 
that's what we did. Uh, we connected with the Institute for Functional Medicine. They trained doctors. And we, by we, I had a co-founder who was working with me at the time and someone young enough to be my daughter. And she would see a lot of the people that I like. For example, if I was seeing the mom, she would see the, the child for, for some coaching. And so we approached the Institute for Functional Medicine and they were very interested in starting a program to train health coaches. So they collaborated. So we are a formal collaboration with the Institute for Functional Medicine. What we do is train people to become health coaches and they come from all walks of life, all ages. We've got people just out of college or increasingly people who are out of high school and they realize like, Maybe, you know, I'll put off or maybe I don't need a four-year degree. I could become certified as a health coach as a starting point. And we also have people, have students in their 80s who thought they were in retirement and they are coming back to study. They're, it's all online. And so they're able to do it from anywhere. And they're very inspired to give back. And so this is my mission now. When I was 65 and started the school, a lot of people who said, my husband included, like, what do you need this for? You know, just maybe work a few more years. You have a nice local practice as a psychologist and, and then retire. And that's what most of my friends were doing, my contemporaries. And I just felt like, no, I, I felt like I had a bigger calling, a bigger purpose. And that is to see the day when there's a coach in every doctor's office so that when someone is hurting and struggling, uh, they go to their doctor. They're not going to be dismissed or just handed a pill for every ill, but really have a coach to be by their side, to help them to find meaning and purpose in their lives, to make changes so that they can lead healthier, better lives. Beautiful. And yes, and also all of it. I love how we start out on these paths and, and we, because I was a teacher, I did that in early Head Start and Head Start. And then there was an opening in the mental health division and my degree was in psychology and I wound my way into that. And it just, I, it, I would just wound my way through it. <laughs> yes, I love how you say that. Exactly, it's winding your way. And just, it's a lot of it is, is happenstance or, be, or just like feeling like there's a, it's just meant to be, yes. this is your path. Beautiful. Well, and I and one of the things you just touched upon was that um, having a coach in every doctor's office, and I love the idea of holistic healing because when I had reached out to find a new doctor, we moved uh, five states away. We were in Ohio, moved to South Carolina, and so I'm um, living on Hilton Head Island, and said, "Oh, I need to find a doctor," and started to reach out, and and sometimes saying. I really am looking for, for a holistic doctor, not someone who's going to throw a pill at everything, uh, like you just said. And that's, it's, it's coming around more and more and more, but it's still a struggle to find. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, doctors are overwhelmed. They are, especially now, they're, they're acute care. And so they have a wonderful job that they do. So if you break your leg, uh, you don't need an integrative functional medicine. If you're having a heart attack, you go you get the best in, in Western medicine in acute care. And then it's those conditions that are more chronic, the type two diabetes, the, all of the autoimmune conditions, depression, anxiety, uh, those are things that a more holistic approach, uh, really focusing on how, your life, what is in your life, and we look at how, what are you eating, and are you getting joy in eating, and speaking of joy, what's your relationship, what, what are your relationships like, your community, your social circle, are you getting enough sleep, are you moving throughout the day, are you doing things that you, you love, do you have a meaning and purpose? And so those are some of the things that we look at They're in the functional medicine, we call them modifiable lifestyle factors. And as you change some of those things and develop new habits, that impacts even down at a cellular level and even creates different markers for your genes. So it's fascinating how much more we're learning about these connections. 
Yeah, that's just so amazing. And I, I've studied, well, brain, brain plasticity and habitual patterns. And yes, and it really does. I mean, just such a profound impact, particularly on those with trauma history and ACEs and being able to re recognize, oh, I'm not stuck like this. I'm not broken, that I can make these changes in my life uh, that will have a, a impact physiologically, emotionally, spiritually. Oh, absolutely. And in functional medicine, we, uh, it, a lot of it is based on your personal narrative, telling your story. Doctors don't have time to really listen. They want to, but there are constraints. They're given seven minutes or 15 minutes would be a lot of time with a patient. Sometimes they're told you can only address one condition or one symptom on this visit. So then people are just left uh, without somebody to be their support, their guide. And we look at telling your story. And often when somebody tells their story, then it is in functional medicine that is placed on a timeline. And so, for example, it starts way before you're born. What was uh, what happened with your parents or even your grandparents if they had trauma. We're finding that that impacts you. So uh, I know a lot of from my community, a lot of people who uh, were uh, their family were Holocaust survivors. And so it goes back to parent, but also grandparents that has some impact. And it, it actually affects your genes and a lot of things that we're looking at in terms of your past. So it's before birth and then during birth and then afterwards look and we look at those those markers, those events. And so, you know, it's, uh, you've had a lot of trauma, a lot of uh, childhood experiences and first uh, the ACEs that you've described and helped so many people with. And so those are on your timeline, the functional medicine timeline. What we like to add that from in our coaching program is so the doctor, the functional medicine doctor is looking for those, those experiences that we call them triggers or perpetuators. So for example, it could be something environmental. So you, it's a whole history that they're taking and maybe what could be, maybe you're surviving pretty well and then you moved and you have a new house and you have a lot of renovations going on. Well, that might have been a, an exposure to something that's environmental. And then now maybe six months to a year later, you're starting to have some new symptoms pop up. And so we would address those as well. And then in positive psychology, what we do is put, we look at resiliency. So it's not just the events what what happened to you but how did you survive what did you use and that would be things like perseverance or love of learning maybe you went on to study all about uh, what was going on or perhaps uh, you're not going to give up you're going to different doctors so if that doctor isn't meeting your needs you might keep going and find someone else maybe courage is always in there so bravery to be able to uh, come through these experiences so what we do then as a coach is you have a, a you you retell the story and you retell it bringing in somebody's essential character strengths. Those are key parts of positive psychology. It has to do with your goodness, your these traits that have to do with wisdom and courage and spirituality and things that are there with you from, for the, from the time you were little. And it's what you're known for. So there are specific, like somebody might be known for their sense of humor. And it's one of the ways that they thrive. Uh, it might be your creativity. So uh, many uh, people are, have been helped through positive psychology. Instead of feeling stuck, like there's something wrong with me, I'm damaged, uh, I can never change, and feeling hopeless. In fact, hope is a strong character strength. This helps to feel like, yeah, I can, I can survive and not only survive, I can thrive and change and become anti-fragile, as we say. 
Yeah. Well, I'm your new biggest fan because <laughs> that's what seriously like hope is is the center of all that I do. And I I love that idea of offering that. Um, I, I'm so surprised I'd not heard of positive psychology before and it hadn't come across my radar. So I'm absolutely loving this. Um, yeah. So thank you for that. And thank you for the work you're doing. Beautiful. Thank you. Well, hope is of the care. There are 24 characters for strengths. So I can explain well, how the field came about and, and what those are. Mm. So around the mid nineties, uh, Martin Seligman was president of the American Psychological Association. And he actually is, is widely recognized as the father of positive psychology. And this were, they were a group of people, psychologists who wanted to know what constitutes a life well lived? How do people thrive? Because prior to that, it was all about people who were damaged, who were, uh, again, psychoanalytic, or you need years and years of therapy, something wrong with you. This was looking at what's right with people. And so it's uh, there are two basic uh, areas that are really important. One is the concept of PERMA. So what does it mean to have a life well lived. And so it's the acronym PERMA, P-E-R-M-A. The P stands for positive emotions. So you wanna have those positive emotions, life satisfaction. And that's really tied in with physical health, emotional health, and ability to change your behavior. And then the E is for engagement or flow. There's a whole field of study about flow. So I'm talking to you right now. And as I'm looking in the camera, I'm imagining you know, that you're there and I'm totally focused. So if my husband were to walk by, I might not even be aware that that happened because I'm in this such state of active listening and awareness. So that's flow. The R, that it's, so we call it engagement or flow, so that's the E. The R is relationships that are meaningful, relationships that uh, bring you joy. And then the M is meaning and purpose in life. What do you have to live for? And then the A is achievement. Now, achievement doesn't have to be I win an award or I want something. Achievement is I got up and I made my bed or I set out to go out and take a walk, I achieved that today. So PERMA is, how do we get to PERMA? We get there through our character strengths. That's the backbone, the foundation. There are 24. How did we determine 24? Well, Martin Seligman and a bunch of researchers, they set out to find these and they went to the literature. They looked at the teachings of philosophy, all the religions, they looked around the world, they looked at cultures, they looked at the philosophy of psychology teachings. They came up with these essential 24 that kept appearing over and over and over, no matter where you live, around the world or what your beliefs were, these were coming up. And so some of them are of the mind, like judgment and perspective, being able to put things in perspective, perhaps. Some are of the heart, uh, like love and kindness. Some are interpersonal and some are just within you. Now, you may be wondering, well, how do I know what my strengths are? And so we have some that are signature strengths. They're kind of what we're known for. So for example, appreciation of beauty and excellence is one of my top strengths. I've always been like that. I've always been just in awe of things around me, natural beauty as well as man-made. Uh, you know, somebody's wearing something that's beautiful or a room is beautifully decorated. I deeply appreciate that. Creativity is one of my top strengths, love of learning, zest. So, you know, I'm always standing and bouncing around. <laughs> Years ago, I thought that was ADD, uh, but now we're calling it zest. So you could go to the VIA, it's V-I-A dot org. That is a nonprofit. They are focused on the study of character strengths, and they have a free survey you can take it and find out what your top ones are that you get. We all have all 24, just some come more naturally to us. Yeah. So for example, my husband, 
is more naturally prudent. And I am more naturally just like the opposite of that in terms of the zest. But he'll say, okay, let's wait. I think we should need to be more cautious about things. And I have prudence, like, and, and sometimes that's led to being more fearful. So I will show a lot of prudence if I'm, I'm where I live, there's a lot of hiking trails and oh, okay, I'm not going to risk, you know, it looks a little too steep for me. So that's how I might show my prudence. So you can find out and all of our students at Functional Medicine Coaching Academy take their own survey. And this is what they use to help people because when you are looking at a strengths focus, and finding those strengths. It really gives you a whole different perspective and able to overcome adversities. You could also give them to your kids. If you're homeschooling, it's a great way. Do you have a strengths talk? And what strengths did I use today? Or you set an intention at the beginning of the day. Okay, I'm going to use my honesty strength today or I'm going to uh, appreciate humor in somebody today. So uh, you can play with your strengths. There's, um, again, see how you can use them. Have strengths talk with your family. Companies have used them for employees. Spouses have you know, taken that and, and then have conversations of how they can support one another through their strengths. Yeah. And that's exciting. And I'll go do that when we're done. <laughs> but I, I instantly thought to myself, I'm so curious to find out if I have such an appreciation for like, I'm that person that is in all of sunsets and beautiful gardens. And yes, I just, well, my Facebook page is filled with pictures. My friends get putting all the sunset pictures and sunrises. Out yeah. There. yeah. Oh. Beautiful. That's wonderful. All right. So let's, go a little bit into mind body medicine that was another thing that i saw on your website uh talk to us a little bit about that mind body medicine is really the study of how the mind and body work together when i started out doing this in the 70s there wasn't even a name for the field and uh, this was looked at very skeptically by medical professionals, the scientific community. Well, now we have the data. There's been thousands upon thousands of studies. It means that, and there was something when I would give a talk or, or work with clients as a psychologist, I would always say what's real in the mind is real in the body. And it has to do with our perception. And so if we are, uh, for example, if uh, I was standing in line at an amusement park to go on a thrill ride, I would be really afraid. And I would be telling myself, I don't want to do this. I'm scared. And so I would be producing those thoughts and maybe remembering a time in the past that wasn't a good experience on a roller coaster. And so just having that thought, picturing it, imagining that it was going to be bad, well, my heart would be pounding. I Perhaps I would be sweating. I might have cold hands. So it's a reaction that's personalized because it wasn't the roller coaster that was causing it because there might be, a let's say, a bunch of kids in line in front of me and they're like, yes, I'm so excited. I can't wait. They're having a completely different reaction emotionally. Their thoughts are different and then that's affecting the body. So everything we think, it's like, I used to explain this as a sorting system, like you're sorting laundry. And every thought, every emotion, go. there's like two, two big bins, darks, lights. And if you say, no, oh, I can, I, this, this could be challenging, but I'll deal with it. I can get through it. It's not so bad. I've been there before. I will use my problem solving and uh, that's going to be in the light bin. It's not going to trigger an alarm response. If you say, I can't stand it. This is awful. Why is, why is this happening to me? This is terrible. Um, and you are saying that to yourself. You are then producing that emotional reaction. Perhaps it's um, embarrassment or it's anger or it's shame or some of those more neg what we call negative, the really uncomfortable feelings that will send signals up oh, danger. There's a danger and it's like a home alarm. And so that would be in that dark laundry bin and there's no in between. You're either one or the other. 
you are either in a, a, a state of what we would call an arousal state, a sympathetic arousal state, uh, because the body thinks it's danger. And then the opposite is you're in a parasympathetic or what we would say more of a relaxed state. Now there's different levels to that because if you, I used to have terrible panic attacks. That was the highest level where I thought I was dying. I had to go to the emergency. I did go to the emergency room many times when I was in my twenties. Yeah. And so that's the highest level that I'm dying. Uh oh, I better call the paramedics. This is it. I can't breathe, I'm going to pass out, or it's maybe you're waiting to give a talk on stage. Uh, so that would be maybe your, your heart's pounding, maybe you're broken to a little bit of a sweat, but it's, it's a little bit of lower level. It's like a ladder, and you're not way up at that top. Uh, and it's, it's like a home alarm. And so uh, when we are looking at this mind-body connection, what we can change, because we can't often change the situation. That is, the, what's happening is a potential stressor. And, but again, it's, it's individual, like with that roller coaster. So for me, thought of going on a thrill ride is a stressor. For somebody else, they're looking forward to it. It's a fun thing. And so it's how we react and how we interpret what is going on that is causing that physiological reaction. So that's the mind-body connection. We travel together 24 hours a day and one influences the other and vice versa. We know if we're in pain, well, that's gonna lead to mood changes. So if you have chronic headaches, I used to work with many people uh, with chronic pain and that was it was debilitating and so that often affected their mood. And so they were depressed as a result. Yeah. And it shifts. You can't logically talk yourself out of a panic attack. I mean, once you're in that, that alarm has gone off, right? Shifts happen in the brain and the way we're thinking. So what can happen, and I, I actually wrote a, a book about this, um, and stop panic attacks and 10 easy stuff. And it, what the first step is recognizing that is a panic attack. So I saw many people, I used to specialize in working with people with, with severe panic. And first they go to doctor or doctor because they can't, it's so, it is real. It's real in the body. And so they think they're having a heart attack. They think there's something wrong neurologically. And so it's first, it's panic, really understanding this mechanism of this home alarm. And think about if it's your danger. So let's say uh, you think you're under attack or you think there's a, a fire in the house. So you press the alarm. Well, now you have the emergency vehicles out and they ha it's an instant reaction. So in other words, you push, your, push the button and it's the alarm's on. And so it happens so fast that some people think, well, how could it be my thought? But it's, a, it's like a trigger of a thought, an emotion, an association, like the thought, I can't breathe. I'm going to die. Instantly, if you believe that, that will trigger this. And so the, trigger the physiological response. Once you've set off the home alarm, think about if that were to happen in your home. Well, these you know, you've got fire the engines, they're coming to your house. They're not just going to, if you say, oh, never mind, it, it was a false alarm. They're going to stay around a little bit. They're going to check things out. So I always told people to calm your, to get down from a panic attack, you have to have patience. And so you have, you start saying things like soon, you know, this is I, in a little while. I'm going to wait it out. I have the strength. I have the patience. This is my body who thinks there's a false alarm. And so uh, in, as I wait, I'm going to practice some breathing. Wow, this is a, a great time to check out how I'm breathing because usually you're hyperventilating or you're breathing so fast or you're holding your breath. So you start to take some breaths. And then as you take a breath, you want to look at, well, where am I breathing from and attach some imagery to it. So perhaps you have some favorite image that you're some sayings you have and distraction is also. So 
once you have the sense that, okay, I am happy to recognize it's a panic attack, I'm not dying, and what, how my breathing will help, I'm gonna have patience. So you slow down your breathing, and as you slow down your breathing, your thoughts are gonna stop racing and start to slow down. And then you'll feel your heart rate slowing down. But for many people with panic, and I was one, so tuned into what's going on inside in this fear response, that what can pull you out is going outside of yourself. And watching TV or just picking up a book is may not do it because that's more passive. You're still focused on the panic. What can you do that'll get your mind engaged? Years ago, I had this lovely woman that had severe debilitating panic attacks I would work with. And she would call me up, Sandy, this is it. I, I, I go to the hospital. I, I, I'm going to die. I have such a, I, I, I'm shaking. I don't know what to do. I can't breathe. I would say to her, Seal, okay, let's choose. She had a big, um, she had a, um, was, uh, uh, have a lot, had a lot of closets. She had been in her house for many, many years and a lot of closets that were uh, filled with memories and things that she needed to sort through. And I said, okay, Seal, we're gonna, you're gonna come to, you're gonna choose which closet. Um, you're gonna then uh, see which box in that closet you're gonna take down. I want you to call me back in an hour. She would call back, Sandy, oh, I got so involved. I found an old scrapbook and oh, I can't believe I feel fine. I'm back to, you know, I, I feel good now. And why it was because she pulled her focus to something that was neutral or even good. And so now she's being flooded with different signals. And so uh, that was creating all the difference. Yeah. And I've done it and I love that. And it's so true and it works. <laughs> yes. Well, I told you before we hit record that I had therapy dog Sammy and she was, she was one of my saving graces, even though we went through therapy dog training uh, to help others and to work with children. It was wonderful to have her in our home because I was able to learn to utilize, um, yeah, her and just focus yeah. on the softness of her yes. fur yes. and to just, you know, put my hand on her and let her breathe and, and just go uh, along to her breathing. And yeah. it really did make a huge difference. I, I have panic attacks. I, I don't no longer have them, but when I did driving, uh, counting the lights, like sitting at an intersection. But yes, it was moving outside of myself. It was beautiful. Yeah. yeah. I used to get panic attacks driving as well on, on highways and uh, worked with many people who had a fear of driving and panic while driving. I, the message I really want to convey to listeners is hope having hope. And when you talked about Sammy, I recall the time I used to do a lot of consults in hospital for what we call psychosocial oncology, where I was bringing this to people who had cancer off an end stage. And I remember one woman who was struggling to breathe and in a lot of pain. So I would guide her through some breathing and uh, she was really missing her cat because she was, a, was hospitalized. And so I had her just put her hand on her belly and just imagine that you know, her cat is, was, was lying there and feeling the warmth, breathing in sync with her cat, breathing. And she was able to settle herself. And then when I came to see her the next day, she said, yeah, that was something she just kept really calling upon over and over again. So you know, your cat's not with you, but then I had our uh, family member bring some pictures and then that triggered these positive associations of warmth and sinking her breathing to her cat, even in her imagination. Yeah. Oh, what a, what a great gift to give to that woman. Beautiful. All right. So how do people get involved with your program if they're interested in doing this um, or, or how do they, if, if they're not interested in, in signing up to be a coach or going through the program, are, are they coaches can be found online? Is there a source where they can contact a coach? Absolutely. So our website is functional medicine coaching.org. And really what brings people to our program to study to be coaches is a calling to serve. 
feeling like you don't you don't need advanced credentials you don't have to come from healthcare many people who enroll have a background they perhaps were nurses or they may have been in wellness as yoga teachers they are spiritual leaders we have people who have been doctors we have a lot of people retired a lot of teachers a lot of people who come from teaching or counseling background and uh, the or people who are um, stay-at-home moms. We have a lot of people who have homeschooled and they're are, or they're career changers. So perhaps they're in a in a position. Maybe it's been disrupted now, and they no longer have that position. Maybe it was a brick and mortar uh, practice as a acupuncturist massage we have a number of people in that category and they're thinking to add something to what they're already doing many people are in corporate and they'd like something different and so they start by having a few people coaching on the side keeping what they're currently doing so there's a number of ways to do this and the common thread is that it's it feels good to have a mission and purpose if you're to know that many people actually i should say uh, many people have a health crisis themselves and or they've had you know, trauma in their lives and they have a strong a personal story to tell that they want to reach a, an audience that can be inspired and change it for the better based on their own stories. So they may find us that way and are now going out and, and serving and giving back. And uh, people are coming to our website to find a coach. So they we have some uh, people on our team who can uh, direct them to somebody who could work with them. And the good news now is that it's virtual. People are finding out that they like it better. It's just as effective. So we train our coaches to work either in person or increasingly virtually and to lead groups. And that's so, so wonderful as well because we say the community becomes the medicine, so to speak. Get people together to support one another and the coach can be the facilitator for that. Yeah, wonderful. I love it. All right, so is there anything else that you wanted to touch upon today that we didn't have an opportunity to talk about? Just to pursue your dream. Uh, we have uh, to to, to know that you can, uh, to start. Many people are, they hold themselves back. They think, I'm not good enough, or I don't have the degree or the formal education or the training, and uh, should I really take a chance? To, I want to have to feel like I was uh, meant for more or want to do something different. I'm not, uh, but they, they, they fear getting started, and uh, uh, we just jumped in and started Functional Medicine Coaching Academy. So if there's anything that you're passionate about, you know, start before you're ready because you'll never think you're ready. Um, and so jump right in to pursue your dream and, and design it the way you want. Yes. Well, I told you again that I, I went to your site and I just loved everything that I saw. I loved, uh, I watched the video. Um, I think there was maybe like an eight minute video, five minute video and uh, yeah, signed up because for information, because again, I just think it's such a beautiful gift that you're offering to others. Um, along the healing journey to to just bring it all together on that mind body soul connection thank you it's our, our mission and purpose to train thousands of coaches to go out and help people lead healthier lives wonderful all right uh once again people can visit where is this web website again it's functional medicine coaching Dot org and that's also our facebook functional medicine coaching academy wonderful all right well it's been a pleasure having you here today and thank you so very much for joining me oh uh, thank you honored to be here awesome all right well everyone thank you for being here today and remember until next time be gentle with yourself thanks bye-bye thank you so much for listening today to the healing place podcast with your host and trauma warrior Terry Welbrock. If you enjoyed this episode and want to learn more about Terry, her mission, and the Hope for Healing journey, visit Terry's website at www.terrywellbrock.com. Thank you for liking, commenting, sharing, and offering your reviews 
on our YouTube channel, audio outlets, and Facebook page. And as Terry reminds us, until next time, remember, be gentle with yourself.